My name is Mike Irvin. I'm an organizing director with the Operating Engineers, Local 139. We are a statewide local union that um, covers the heavy equipment operators in our state. Um, background about me, in 1992 when I graduated from Racine Washington Park High School, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I went to college for a few years, still didn't know what I wanted to do, and was fortunate enough to get into the apprenticeship with the Operating Engineers. And um, fortunately I was able to know a good amount about unionism because my father was a cement mason in the union and my brother was a carpenter. Um, gave me a good avenue to take care of my family. Um, a life in the day of an operating engineer can be anywhere from working night shifts, day shifts, uh, high rises if you're in a tower crane, uh, deep tunnel work with a crane, op operating heavy equipment such as dozers, excavators, and loaders. Um, it all depends on, on the different day that you're at and the different site that you're at. Our apprenticeship program is based off of a 6,000 hours working on the job and 400 hours up at our training center in Coloma, Wisconsin. And a starting apprentice in this area is about 20, anywhere from 28 to 30 dollars an hour. And then as a journeyman, you're on the low 40s um, on the small equipment and maxing out um, on your uh, tower cranes or your larger size cranes um, at 48.16. Um, and we also do have, I've talked with some of the people at, at uh, Racine School Districts and other districts in Southeast Wisconsin about our Destinations Career Academy program. And we do have a academy for the operating engineers where the students can get dual credits. They get a credit for, um, to graduate through their high school and they're also getting credits for our apprenticeship program, which, help, uh, which would help give you a little edge when you get out of high school if you do choose to come our way. So. Um, it's a great career. Um, all the trades work great together, and it's, it's really neat to be able to say, um, you know, to tell your kids all the time, hey, I helped build that, I helped build that, and, and they'll remind you that, you know, I, I know Daddy, you've told me that a hundred times by now, but um, it's a great career, and it, like we always say, it's not a job, it's a career. Hi, my name is Corey McGovern. I am uh, a laborer with Laborers Local 113. I've been a member for over 25 years. I started off my construction career right out of high school, building condos and making $10 an hour with no benefits. Learned that there was companies out there that paid more and offered more. Found out they were union companies. So I worked at Riley Construction here in the Kenosha area for about 13 years before I got the position I'm in now. Uh, laborers, uh, we cover a very a uh, vast, diverse uh, part of the construction field. We do everything from road work, uh, bridge work, sewer work, building, uh, uh, building projects like schools and places you may have heard of like Pfizer Forum, Miller Park, and Lambeau Field. Uh, we start off in the low $20 an hour range all the way up to 30. We have an apprenticeship program. We offer health care and a pension as well as other trades and we work with all the trades as a team. Thanks. Hey, I'm Tom Boyle. I'm a bricklayer. Uh, I've been a bricklayer for 35 years. I'm currently a business rep for the Bricklayers and Allied Craft Workers Associated District Council of Wisconsin. Um, our apprenticeship is a four year program. It's uh, 4,680 hours with 420 day school hours. Uh, our apprentices start out at 65% of journeyman's rate, which is 25.94. Journeyman's rate is $39.90 on the check. Both will come with an additional $25.65 in benefits, which is two pensions, health insurance. Um, total package for uh, journeyman is $65.53. Bricklayers uh, lay brick, block, stone. Uh, we represent tile setters, terrazzo mechanics, uh, plaster, cement masons in certain parts of the state. Um, all of our work is uh, a physical type job, um, but you need to know mathematics and geometry. Uh, Hi, my name is Sean Coates. I'm a business representative with the United Brotherhood of Carpenters. Specifically, I represent two trades that you might not have heard of, uh, millwrights and the pile drivers. I finished high school in 1996 and became a millwright as a millwright apprentice in 1997. And uh, worked my career 
as an apprentice, then became a journeyman, and then shortly after that, a foreman, and uh, then started estimating projects. So pretty much putting a real good educated guess on a project and figuring out how much it's going to cost and how much time it's going to take. Um, so there is definitely a career progression. Millwrights work on just about every single type of factory machinery that you could think of. <coughs> pretty much if it moves, we're working on it. Um, from the conveyors in a, in a food plant <coughs> to the roof at Miller Park. And pile drivers are a little bit different than, than the other trades within the carpenters as well. Pile drivers will set large steel down into the ground, sometimes hundreds of feet, so that large structures um, can be built upon it and they don't sink. It might be uh, cylindrical piling, so pipe or uh, age piling, which is typically uh, called like an I-beam, but it's 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 age piling. And these uh, these different foundations are engineered for different structures like bridges or or tall buildings. They're also experts in deep foundation and may drive what is called sheet piling down to do soil retention and keep whatever soil on one side and then the excavated area on the other side. We also have pile driver divers that will go down underwater and either work on or maintain foundations at uh, a deep water level or sometimes even shallower levels. But they are experts in the uh, foundations underwater. So there's a lot of education that goes into these two trades. Um, definitely math is, is key to it, but uh, beyond that, it's really having, having a good attitude and ready to learn. Um, we're going to teach you the rest of it. Thank you. My name is Jim Anderson. I'm the business rep for the Carpenters Union. I'm also a 1994 graduate of Washington Park High School. Um, a carpenter basically builds from in the ground doing footings and foundation work all the way to handing the keys over to the owner. Um, in between that we do walls, whether it's wood or um, steel. We do drywall, some insulation, um, all the flooring, uh, acoustical ceilings, and, uh, and doors and hardware and specialty trims. Um, to become a carpenter, you have a four-year apprenticeship. Um, you start off knowing very little, <coughs> getting into, towards the end, being able to be the person in charge for, of the, for being a journeyman. Um, you can, once you journey out, you can, you can try to achieve the status of being a foreman, a general foreman, a superintendent, or maybe even down the road, a uh, owner of your own uh, owner of your own company. Um, today, um, when the young people start in our industry, they're always asking like what they should be doing in high school. My my choices, my response to that would be take as many construction classes as you can, stay on your mathematics, and whatever they have to offer for technology. Is, is a plus. Right now in our industry, technology starting to take over. You see, um, when I first started, everything was on blueprints and the big office trailers. Nowadays, everything's on a on an iPad using stuff like Bluebeam. Hi, my name is Brad Kalsik. I'm a business representative and apprenticeship training coordinator for Sheet Metal Workers Local 18. Uh, I've been in the trade for 17 years now, and 16 of that was as a apprentice and journeyman and foreman out in the field. And the last three years I've been in now, for two years as uh, the business rep and apprenticeship training coordinator. Uh, I started back not knowing what a sheet metal worker was, never heard of it. Just my neighbor worked at for a contractor and I seen, you know, he was making good money and had a house and he kind of got me in the business there and I started getting into the union probably about the third year of my apprenticeship. Again, not knowing what the union was all about, but I found it interesting, started going to meetings, started learning a lot more. I worked my way up after my apprenticeship as a journey person and I'm into the foreman role and a couple years ago 
position open with our local down here, and I decided to run for it, and now I'm sitting in front of you. A typical day for a sheet metal worker, it's really going to depend on what part of the trade that you're in for us. Uh, HVAC is heating, <coughs> ventilating, and air conditioning. That's the biggest factor of our trade, I would say. Uh, that's what I specialized in, but we have many different parts of our trade that you can get into. Anywhere from sign makers who make uh, signs for exterior <coughs> parts of buildings, uh, service tech who comes around and they do the repairs on air conditioners and furnaces, all the way up to, uh, you're talking about big rooftop units for schools and hospitals. Um, some other things, we do a lot of welding and fabricating. A lot of work we do is in the hospitals or for pharmaceutical companies. A typical apprenticeship for us, it is a five-year, 9,000-hour program. The um, nice thing about it is, that, you know, you're starting out as an apprentice right now, you're going to make $19 an hour just on your check. And for every 2,000 hours you work, you're going to get a wage increase on that until you finish up your apprenticeship. Currently, a journey person is at $38.18 an hour. And that's just your base wage, so that's what you make on your check. That doesn't include the two pensions that you get, plus your health insurance, which is all after the fact. Um, one of the things you can do to get in our trade is, if you want to talk with me, you feel free to contact me. Or we do have an office at the Kenosha Union Club, and we have our apprenticeship office in Racine. Hi, my name is Don Cardinelli. I am a field representative for the International Union of Painters and Allied Trades. Our headquarters is in uh, New Berlin, Wisconsin. You can get a lot of information by going to that website, iupatdc7.com. It is all full of information. Uh, our field covers drywall finishers. Our field covers glazers and painters. The drywall finishers apply a thin coat of mud, we call it, over drywall. Uh, they also know how to spray. The glazers, uh, they apply and uh, put up glass, they cut glass, they do residential, they do walls, uh, they do that. Painters apply paint, varnish, other finish, uh, finishes, they hang wallpaper to learn. So our class has a four-year program, uh, 5,800 hours and 400 hours on the job. When you start as an apprentice, right now the painters are getting 18.66 an hour. Their journeyman rate, after they complete the four years, they'll get 30, close to $38 an hour. Uh, they do go to school up in New Berlin, Wisconsin, and. Uh, if you're going to study for this in high school, I guess the first thing you have to go to school every day because when you're on a, on a job, you have to be there at 8 o'clock in the morning and work till 4.30. That's attendance is very important. Uh, I was a painter by trade. I joined the union in 1973. I got 48 years in as a, uh, as a member. Uh, and uh, if you go to school, like I said, it's four years. The raises are based on 780 hours. So every 780 hours, uh, you get a raise. Once you do become a journeyman in whatever field that you choose, they have journeyman upgrading courses where you can re retrain in specific uh, applications of paint, wallpaper, uh, and glazing that they have uh, different techniques. That's about it. Hi, my name is Brian McCambridge. I'm a business representative for the Iron Workers Local 8. And uh, back in 1982, I was a graduate of Key Wascom High School. And not having a really good guidance uh, counselor at our school, I didn't know uh, what I was going to do, where I was going to be when I got out of high school. So I just did what I could to maintain jobs. Uh, did a lot of different odd jobs. And uh, the pay was never really very good and never had any, anything uh, put away at the end of the day. As, uh, as I was going through life, a uh, few of my friends that I had that were 
in the trades, in the union trades, uh, asked me to go check out the iron workers. And uh, in 1990, I applied for an apprenticeship program for the iron workers. And I was uh, uh, one, one of uh, 120 at the time uh, to get an apprenticeship. I did serve a three year apprenticeship. And uh, with that, later on, you know, got into the stewards, uh, stewardship on the jobs, uh, got into being interested in running some work as a foreman, and uh, from there go into a general foreman and actually got into a superintendent's position. And uh, with that, got more involved with the local as a, as a uh, executive board member and then from there, you know, gained uh, respect from members and eventually got elected in as a business agent. So in the 30 years, I'll, I'll be served at, this year will be my 30th year as an iron worker. I've got uh, the last nine as a business agent. And uh, it's, it's been a good, good career path where I didn't know what a career was before I got into the iron worker apprenticeship program. And that's a, a, is a big uh, a plus to join an apprenticeship and uh, take the training that was offered. And with any apprenticeship, the sky is the limit. You, there is no limit on you, on what you can do, what you can achieve. It's a, it's a self-motivating, you, you gotta be self-motivated, you gotta want out, you, you gotta want out, you gotta wanna go out and get it. And uh, uh, to be a, an owner, that's uh, that's the highest level you can get as a, uh, as, uh, you know, being in a construction trade is being an owner of a, of a company. Uh, some of the things that we do, uh, basically, uh, you walk into a school, you walk into a church, you walk into a bar, you you drive across the bridge, you go into any any high-rise building. Uh, there's a good chance that we had a part of of those projects, um, and with all the trades in uh, collaboration working together, uh, we build. You know, we build America, and we build it uh, with union trades. We do not uh, discriminate uh, with anybody. Everybody is welcome, and uh, we do have a currently a four-year apprenticeship program, which you start out at 23:47, and it's uh, 6,000 hours. Uh, once you hit 6,000 hours, then you start, uh, you know, peaking out and then you're, you have the opportunity to take a journeyman's test. And once you get your journeyman's card, then you're able to travel uh, throughout the United States and Canada with that journeyman's card. Um, and you're welcome uh, in every local within our international to work. And uh, I do have some comparisons you know, between college tuition and serving a four-year apprenticeship. Uh, just a, a number that we got from the University of Madison or University of Wisconsin, Madison, uh, just tuition alone after four years without books or without you know the cost of living or anything else, just tuition alone, you could be in debt $50,000 after four years. And with an apprenticeship program, after working on the job, serving your apprenticeship, you could be $200,000 plus in your bank account. So there's a big difference with a college uh, path compared to an apprenticeship <coughs> path. And uh, the best move I made in my life was getting an apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tim Rausch. Uh, I'm a business agent with Local 118 Plumbers and Steam Fitters right here in Kenosha, Wisconsin. and. Uh, what happened uh, many years ago was my mom came to me when I was a uh, junior in high school and she said, this year you're going to decide what you're going to do with your life. And I said, what do you mean by that? She says, well, you're going to choose a career path. And uh, that really got me blindsided. I didn't have any ideas. And she said, how about one of the trades? So I picked plumbing uh, as a trade to get, get involved in. I, with. I did some research on it, got a book that, that uh, showed some simple plumbing in it, and uh, I went to the local union office and signed up for an apprenticeship. 
And then they called me in for an interview after that. I went to an interview and I sat down in front of five or six guys with, that uh, were on the apprenticeship committee and they said, it says here you want to be a plumbing uh, apprentice. And I said, yeah, that's right. And they said, well, we hired uh, two plumbing apprentices in the last, in the last year. And they said, what number are you on the waiting list for the, for the plumbing apprenticeship? And I said, well, I'm about 75. And they said, let's see, in about 30 years, you'll have your apprenticeship. And I said, <laughs> what the heck am I going to do? And they, they said, well, you could be a steam fitter. And I had no idea what that was. But a steam fitter, that's what I decided to get involved with. I decided to be a, a steam fitter apprentice. And uh, steam fitters do heating cooling, refrigeration, process piping in factories, piping in, in uh, power plants. We do a lot of different uh, things. Our trade is pretty wide. And uh, so I, did, I got involved in, with that. I, I, they said, well, you're going to have to uh, do something to better yourself as, as an apprentice applicant, like go take some classes. So I decided to uh, sign up for a welding class full time, quit my job, went to a full full time welding class for one semester over here at Gateway in Kenosha, and uh, I got that diploma and I took it back to the business manager at the Union Hall and he said this is going to help tremendously. I went down to 16th on the list, and uh, within a year. I got a phone call and said, hey, uh, you want to start your apprenticeship now? So I went to work uh, over at uh, the power plant in Pleasant Prairie and started my apprenticeship over there. And uh, it, it was a five-year apprenticeship. Uh, we have to have uh, 8,000 hours of day school. And that was something else that my dad told me why you wanted to be an apprentice. Because you get paid to go to school. And I thought, who's going to pay me to go to school? I'm not even a good student. But they did. They paid me to go to school. It was amazing. And I said, that's one of the huge benefits of our program. Not only that, do we, we have good health insurance. We have a pension program. We make $45.45 per hour net pay, plus health insurance, plus, plus a good pension and training. We have our own training hall that we pay for, not the government. Our members pay for that training. And so uh, <coughs> those were a few of the things. Uh, I served a five-year apprenticeship. Uh, let's see, we, had to, we have to have uh, about 300 hours of night school with that program. Uh, also, we have to have uh, 500 hours of day school with that program. It's, and uh, so after that, after I completed that apprenticeship, uh, you get a journeyman's card, and you're able to go work for any contractor in the United States. If it's union, if you're union, which we are, you know, they will find you a, a job. The union will find you a job in, uh, in the United States, or maybe right in your hometown with a contractor, if you're not already working for somebody that you like to work for. Uh, you, can, you can travel if you'd like to. Um, there's a lot of different, uh, what we do in our, a day in our career, if you're a plumber, a uh, plumber is one of the first people out on the job, say for instance, building, we're going to build a school. Um, a plumber will, will be, uh, after they do the excavating for the, for the school, a plumber will come out and install the underground waste and vent piping for the underground, a steam fitter would be, would come to the job after the walls and maybe the roof would be on of the school and start installing the uh, HVAC piping and equipment as the job progresses. Uh, also, so uh, there's a lot of different aspects to our trade. You know, some of the other guys have talked about uh, where you can go with this, you could be your own business owner, you, or you can just be a plumber or steam fitter, journeyman plumber or steam fitter your, your whole life and uh, make good money. We make, uh, we earn a good living. We're, most of our guys are working year-round. 
We're not, uh, although we are affected somewhat by weather, uh, most of the time we're inside, our job is inside the building. So um, that's, uh, that's about all I have. Thanks. My name is Felix Ramirez. I'm with the Cement Masons and Plasters Union. And I'm going to speak about what the Cement Masons do and how I got into it. Uh, I started off doing precast concrete for a company out of Burlington. And then did that for a couple of years and then I got into this union that I'm in now. What a finisher does is we do a lot of, we do footings, we do finished floors. But then there's another side of it where we do a lot of road work. Uh, typical day for a building trades finisher, which is doing the, the floors, is doing a lot of floors, buildings, um, patchwork, and it can it can be it can uh, have a lot of different things going on. You can have a lot of different things that you're doing. So it's got a pretty wide scope of stuff you're doing as far as the building trades. On the road, it's mostly going to be paving. We have a three-year program with our, for our apprenticeship. It's 6,500 hours to graduate, and that's work hours and, uh, and school. And we do three weeks in school every year, and that's in the winter. Um, as far as the winter, it does slow down a little bit, but a lot of guys are able to keep going, keep working through. There is inside work available. Yeah, that's about it. Hello, my name is Trey James. I'm a plasterer. I'm actually a statewide uh, plasterer agent organizer. Um, I took this position two years ago. Uh, I've been a plasterer for 27 years. Uh, the first few years I served a, a non-union apprenticeship. Um, but working for the non-union uh, contractors in the plaster field, they didn't provide uh, health care or insurance. Uh, I was a, a single parent with two, son, two sons at home, and I needed insurance. So I left the plastering trade and drove truck for a few years until somebody told me about the plasterers union. And I looked into it, and I left that, uh, that uh, uh, truck driving job and joined the apprenticeship. Um, 22 years ago and um, I started uh, it changed the life for my kids and I it, it was just uh, an astronomical change from going from um, struggling uh, in the non-union market for work and contractors that weren't always scrupulous to um, a higher paying job with insurance and health care and a pension it changed the life for my children and I and here we are um, 22 years later, and I'm in a position where I can help bring that to other people. That's my goal. As a, as a plasterer uh, throughout my career, I've had the opportunity to work on, uh, I started out working in um, historical refurbishing, restoring old plaster and old buildings. That, that portion of our trade will never go away. There will always be old plaster buildings that, that need uh, craftsmen to maintain. Um, I've also worked uh, for a long time um, uh, as a fireproofer, uh, climbing the structural steel that the iron workers put up, chasing the iron workers up the high rises. Um, it's it's a very lucrative, expanding field in the plastering, uh, with all the different coatings and the different um, uh, materials that are there. Um, the the plastering industry, uh, the materials are always changing. But the skill set isn't. Um, we uh, the the things you learn in your apprenticeship will carry you through all the new products that come out, all the 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 new technologies that come out. And as they're coming out, uh, our apprenticeships are teaching them. We're learning them. Our our journeymen are coming in and uh, constantly upgrading their skills to stay um, the leaders in our market. Uh, as a craft, the plasterers represent uh, conventional plaster, uh, uh, decorative and ornamental plaster, cement stucco. Uh, we also represent the fireproofers, wet and dry, uh, intumescent coatings. 
air and vapor barriers, um, spray foam, and we also do uh, sound and acoustical plasters like K13 and Uricade. Um, our, we have a three-year apprenticeship program. Um, our apprentices come in at uh, just over $20 an hour, and at the end of their three-year apprenticeship program, they're making uh, uh, over $34 an hour with uh, health and a pension. Hi, my name is Jose Arroyo. I'm going to be pretty quick. Uh, I represent uh, plasters and cement masons. I've been a member since 1995. Um, our trade is, you can either be a cement mason, a plaster, or a fireproofer. It's a good career. you got to listen to the word career because once you become a member, we all have the same opportunities. There are operating classes that you can, that will help you to become either a foreman, a superintendent, and later on either an organizer, a business agent, or just like me that I'm working for, I'm an international field rep. So the opportunity is equal for everybody as a member. I hope you decide uh, to go one of the trades. It's a great career, and uh, like I said, I, 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 had a, I have a really good life because I decided to join the union in 95, and it's been great for me. With this, uh, with this question that was being asked about some of the uh, challenges that we face every day on the job, uh, it's not so much about mathematics. It's, uh, it's uh, a lot about communication. Uh, in our everyday, um, we have we talked about diversity on a job, and that could be from a, a day one Danny, meaning an apprentice, the first day on a job, or a superintendent that hollers and screams at you. Uh, because he's been around for 40 years and he might get a little bit impatient with somebody that doesn't know as much as him. So communication is, uh, is a very, uh, it's a challenge that we need to focus on communication so when we, you know, need a job done that everybody on a crew uh, understands exactly what needs to be done and what's expected of them and a lot of times uh, a younger individual may not want to speak up to say, you know, I don't know, but in being in the trades, it doesn't matter what trade you're coming from or who you're working with. Uh, our goal is that everybody goes home safe at the end of the job site, so we do look out for each other's backs, and that's uh, communication for, for iron workers is a key, uh, especially if you got a, a guy on the ground with a radio, uh, there might be a guy 200 feet up in the air, there could be a crane operator, there could be people working underneath you, uh, swinging live loads. Everybody needs to know what's going on uh, on a job site and uh, I, I feel communication is very important uh, for the iron worker. So as a, as a millwright, I think one of the most exciting things about, uh, about the job is that it is constantly changing. Um, there's all sorts of different environments. When I worked in, in different factories, I did not understand how people could go to the same place and do the same thing every single day. And the cool part of my job was I was able to go to many different places and maybe move the piece of equipment in or maintain it that these people were using to, to generate a product. And then I was off to another place. Or maybe I would be building uh, a platform or fabricating something with steel and welding to be installed in that place. But I got to say bye to that place and move on to something else. And it always was new and exciting, even to, you know, working on Miller Park and working on the tracking system for the roof. That's something, that's one of those that I drive by and I say I built that and my kids get sick of me saying it. But absolutely, you can work your entire career in a multitude of different areas and you're not going to get bored. Uh, the good part about, or what I enjoy about doing concrete work, that uh, every day is a different job, a different test that you have to run to. Um, I like the challenge because uh, it, you can be like working pretty easy one day, but it depends on the weather. You can work as hard as you can to make it look good. Another part that I enjoy is I work in so many buildings around. Uh, this town's Kenosha routine, and uh, it just feels good that uh, when I drive by with my kids, I can tell them 
I work in a building. I pour the floors. I did the foundation, uh, schools, you name it. it. It's just a great feeling. Hi, I'm Brian with the Iron Workers Local 8. Uh, one of the things that I enjoy about the position that I currently have here with the Iron Workers is the ability to help individuals uh, every day. It's a, it's a new challenge, and uh, I, I take that challenge on, and it's a passion of mine to be able to better somebody and, and give them the opportunity or the, the road uh, to success. Uh, it's uh, at the end of the day, uh, success is going home with everything you came to work with in the morning, uh, going home to your family, and being able to turn return to the job the next morning. And one of the rewards is the training that is offered to every member. Uh, the training that we offer is ongoing and it's endless. Uh, so you never you never quit learning. And and today I sit here. There's new technology being introduced into our industry, and we have to stay above it and uh, keep ahead of it so we can continually be safe, productive, and uh, continue, continually having a future for new apprentices coming in. As far as the math that is required for being an operating engineer, there's quite a bit to it. For myself, I was a crane operator. Obviously, when I'm running that crane, I need to know what my boom configurations are, uh, what I'm able to pick. If I'm working with the iron workers and they have a 12,000 pound beam, I need to know that my crane at this configuration can pick 12,000 pounds. Um, obviously, if I wasn't accurate in that uh, assessment, um, that could be pretty damaging for uh, somebody and, and we wouldn't want to hurt anybody. Like some of the guys reiterated, reiterated earlier, um, um, everybody wants to go home safe, um, and, and that's our job. When we're in that crane, we need to make darn sure that we know what we can do and what we can't, um, and we need to stand our ground when we can't do something, because sometimes they will ask you to do something you can't, and you got to let them know that uh, based on all the math applied to what we have here, it's not going to work. On the topic of COVID-19 and how it's affected the trades, um, it, anytime something like this happens, it really, really, one door closes and another door opens. Our, our members, yeah, maybe they did see a little bit of a slight downturn, at least in, in Wisconsin, right, when things were, were shut down, but uh, we were deemed essential workers and the, the economics have, have changed a little bit, but you still need somebody to be able to build different facilities. Food distribution is blowing up everywhere. Um, distribution centers as a whole were on the rise, but now that's been accelerated even more. And so you need people to be able to build those those facilities and to be able to install the equipment inside. So it's changed, and even from the hospital setting, it, it goes into the, the education that we have within our, within our apprenticeships to be able to not only know how to do that work, but how to do that work without spreading germs. Right now, during COVID-19 and beyond, um, whether, whether it's through an infection control risk assessment or there's other curriculum that we're gonna be teaching with our organization how to be able to work within occupied facilities. And it's, it's still kind of that same mindset of to be able to do that work um, safely. So that, that's an advantage to any of our workers to be able to have that knowledge but also to the customer to know that they can still have this stuff going on, move forward with their business and still do it safely. So COVID has, has <coughs> changed the industry a little bit. Um, the great thing about our industry is we were in, you know, essential workers so that we were able to keep working during shutdowns. Um, we still have to do, um, you know, mass at some job sites and uh, on the job site, Usually guys got together um, and ate all at the same time. Now you're seeing a lot more split shift lunches, uh, different areas for lunches, um, which is understandable knowing what we're going through. Um, and sometimes even different shifts where not people are, aren't coming in at, at the same time or leaving the same time. Like uh, before COVID, it was usually like 7 to 3.30 maybe. Everybody coming and going at the same time. Now you see some job sites out there that are doing some, some little later later starts or earlier starts where they in, in finishes. As far as the 
diversity um, in, in the skilled trades itself. Um, all trades um, want that. They all want diversity. Even job sites are requiring that nowadays. But <coughs> everybody gets paid the same no matter what your race or your sex is or anything like that. Um, a lot of trades have adapted to different having different um, uh, di different uh, meetings for different people. Um, the carpenters herself have sisters in the brotherhood where all our our lady members get together, um, talk about the challenges they have, and that they can relate to each other and actually bring them back. They also do a lot of community stuff together to get out and let other females and even females of color see them out doing their job and that way we can actually get a pathway of getting more diversity into our trades. I mentioned that the fin with the finishers and plasters we do have a group within our international that is called the Steel Edge Women that addresses concerns for female finishers and plasters and also we have locally in the Milwaukee era, we have Empower that we're part of, and that's with all the other trades too. Um, and for economical diversity or whatever, they have RWP, a lot of cities will have programs that address um, maybe economically devastated areas, you know, just somebody who's been out of work for a while. So there's a lot of opportunity with that too. Our, our union, the uh, Operative Plaster Cement Masons, along with the Steel Edge Women and Empower Her for uh, women's outreach that we do. We also work with uh, 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 the RTP program, Big Step, um, and Job Corps Kids as far as community outreach into the inner city. And we also uh, are working on a program with UMOS uh, to reach out to the Hispanic community as well in the area. All the trades do to help diversify our crews and our manpower, yeah. uh, along with women, obviously. But um, as we do a lot of career fairs and different events like what you're seeing right now today, and we're in the inner cities, we're in the rural areas, um, we get around the entire state to make sure we let all the students know that there's opportunities here. Uh, no matter where you come from or where you go, and you have an opportunity if you're interested. Um, in the high schools, we do have what's called the Destinations Career Academy. I know a lot of the high schools are going in the academy routes. Um, the operating engineers, we do have our own academy. It was established in the, the, under the McFarland School District under K-12 to give students the ability to get a credit towards their high school graduation and then also a credit towards their apprenticeship program. So in the event that um, an individual wants to become an operating engineer, they can start taking those classes as soon as a freshman in, in the event that a student could take these classes as a freshman all the way through senior year, they'd be halfway done with their related instruction of 400 hours at their training center. So that will give them a really good edge up on getting into our apprenticeship program. Plus our contractors are always looking for those individuals. Um, it is an online class that would be going through our training center. And if there's any questions, um, you can contact myself through your academy director. And uh, we've been talking with um, all the schools throughout the state. Advice uh, for a young student that's interested in any of the trades. Um, it, it can be any of the trades, they can be intimidating. When I first started, I started on a small piece of equipment. I didn't come from a farm, so I hadn't seen any. It was very intimidating to the point where I almost thought about going back to college. I was really close to quitting. Um, I didn't want to let my dad down. I didn't want to let my uh, fiance at the time down. Uh, to provide for the family, so I, I stayed with it. Um, eventually, I became a crane operator running big cranes, and, and like I said, when you first start, it's very intimidating, but it is something that any one of you can obtain if you just give yourself that credit. Um, as far as COVID for the operating engineers, uh, we kind of joke that we've been social distancing since we started because we sit in a piece of equipment by ourselves. Uh, so it hasn't I mean, we're all affected by all the trades, but we're always, as, as operators, we're typically by ourselves running that piece of equipment, so it hasn't hit us as hard. But again, um, it's something that we all got to practice that safe uh, social distancing and wearing your mask because the way we look at it is you got to protect not only yourself, but the person next to you. My advice to the young person out there um, that is looking into the trades, uh, primar primarily any trade, 
I think all of us want somebody that can get up and go to work five plus days a week on time. Um, all of our trades start in usually early or could be on a second shift, but just if you're supposed to start at seven o'clock, you don't get there at five minutes to seven with your shoes untied, trying to figure out what your day is going to look like. The contractor pays you at seven o'clock and you be ready to start working at seven o'clock. And you need to prove yourself that way. It's all about reputation. When you build your reputation and you start and, and you start your career and you start getting there a half hour early every day and you start looking at yeah, you know, asking questions about blueprints and you start asking questions like, how's this work? And you're there every day on time, willing to work late every time it's offered to you, you start building that reputation that will precede you. Even if the contractor starts getting slow, they'll start talking to their other competitors out there just to keep you busy. They will they'll farm you out to another company just to make sure that you're still busy. That reputation will go a long way. <coughs> all, all the trades want people. We understand you're not a skilled person yet. That's our job to train you. That's why we have training centers. <coughs> but you, you need to invest in yourself by showing up on time, being ready, being prepared, and, under, and listening and following directions. Safety is a big concern out there for everybody. You have to be able to listen and follow directions. That will keep you safe.